Previously on this series, we have taken a look at several pathfinding algorithms and they all have one thing in common, and that is they are single source shortest pass algorithms. Of course, what this means is we are finding shortest pass from a single source. One node, we run the algorithm on it and it tells us how to get to every other node. That is useful, but we might want to do a little bit more. And that is why today we're going to be taking a look at an all pair shortest pass algorithm, the Floyd Warshall's algorithm. You're watching another episode of Graph Theory. Hello and welcome back to Graph Theory. As mentioned, today we're going to be looking at the Floyd Warshall algorithm. There actually isn't very much to say because the actual step of finding Schotter's pass is the same as what we've seen in Bellman Ford's and Dijkstra's algorithm. It's just the relaxation step as it's sometimes known. Now, cast your mind back to when we did Dijkstra's algorithm and then when we did Bellman Ford's algorithm. In Dijkstra's algorithm, we perform relaxation in one pass. That is, we really only needed to visit each edge just once, and that's good enough because we strategically pick edges to visit next. In Bellman Ford's algorithm, we don't have that luxury. What we end up doing is we have to perform many passes throughout the entire graph. In fact, we had to perform V passes just to make sure that, you know, we've gotten all the distances correct. And that is just for single source shortest paths. In fact, we're going to have to do V square passes through the entire graph before we can actually find all pairs shortest paths. With this preface in mind, let us jump into the traits. So this is what Floyd Warshall's algorithm looks like. We're going to be tracing it on a very small graph and you will see why very soon. Now, I left out something pretty important in this algorithm and that is what we actually want to initialize the values to. Moving forward, please take any empty square in the 2D arrays to represent a value of infinity. What this means of course is that the algorithm itself should also be updated a little bit to represent this idea. So the first part, that is the setup, involves creating two 2D arrays. There is a distance array which we're going to read like this. The distance from C to A is 3. And we can confirm that by looking at the graph itself. The distance from C to A is indeed 3. So yeah, that's the idea. Essentially, we're going to try and fill in as many boxes as we can, and we're going to make sure that the values in these boxes are at its minimum. We also have a next array, which keeps track of how we go from one node to another. For example, we go from node C to node A via node A. Now, this isn't extremely useful at the present moment, but when we have some alternate connections, this will make more sense. The way we initialize these arrays are as follows. At the very beginning, the distance from each vertex to itself is zero. No surprises there. Then for each edge that is already present in a graph, we want to make sure we take those into account. What this means is given an edge that connects two vertices, for example, this edge here, we take note of its weight and basically take note of that distance. So essentially, we're just taking all the edge weights and the connections and inserting them into this matrix. We're also taking note of the connectivity by writing it into this matrix. So with all this done, we can jump into the actual logic of the program, which as you can see, we create three variables k, i, and j, and basically loop them from 1 to v. Now, this logic you see here should be extremely familiar, because you've actually seen this for both Dijkstra's algorithm and Bellman Ford's algorithm. But just as a quick recap, let us take a closer look at what it means. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to compute an alternate distance. That is, we want to compute the distance going from i to j, but through a detour. We want to see if this distance is actually smaller than the distance of just going directly from i to j. If the roundabout way is actually faster, we want to take it instead. And this is what we sometimes call the relaxation step. 
So yeah, basically with this idea in mind, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna keep looping that again and again, as many times as there are for loop statements here. In other words, well, we're looping through OV cube because we have three nested levels of for loops. As you can imagine, this is quite the boring process because, well, we're gonna have to do quite a lot of work, even on a small graph like this. And a lot of the work is actually redundant. Think about what we're doing here. We wanna check the distance going from A to A. So we do have that, it is zero. And we wanna see if taking a detour to A is actually better, which honestly makes very little sense. As long as we're starting at A, and we try to take a detour through the A, we're not gonna see any improvement in our distances at all. So essentially, the first couple of iterations are pretty pointless. We move on once again. Now we wanna go from B to A through A. Once again, doesn't make a lot of sense. We'll just keep moving on. Now, here's one set that actually makes sense, but unfortunately does not apply to our graph. We wanna go from B to C, and we want to see if taking a detour through A would be faster. The problem is A has no outgoing edges, and so it doesn't actually give you a method to, you know, get back to C. So once again, this is meaningless, and we have to continue on. Basically, yeah, we just keep repeating this process until we find a set of nodes that actually makes some kind of sense. So I'm just going to forward through these slides until we get there. Ah, here's one. Alright, we want to check to see if going from B to A directly, which actually has a distance of infinity, is actually worse compared to going through C. Now, what do we get going through C? Well, we go from B to C, that is 9, then we go from C to A, which is 3, giving us a distance of 12. This is actually valid, we actually update both our arrays, so that now, we know we can get to B to A by incurring a distance of 12, and the way we do it is by going through node C. So hey, this iteration actually gave us some interesting information, and that's great, especially seeing as that, you know, more than half of the work we've done so far is actually pointless. Anyway, with that said, let us continue on. Let's keep going until we find another one, here. So this is a slightly different case. We want to check to see if going from B to D through C is better. Now, we already know at one glance that that is not the case, but of course the algorithm still has to actually perform the computation. Our alternate distance is 9 plus 5, which is 14, whereas our direct distance is 1. Of course, that means that, you know, we don't change anything because the direct connection is much better. As you can see, we've moved right on without updating anything. And once again, we continue with that process. We just keep chugging along, until we find something useful, which is this. As you can see, if we were to step back one slide, the distance from B to A uses this path as we've seen earlier on, but now we've found a shorter path by going through D. Therefore, we update our distance with the new one, that is 1 plus 2, and of course, we change the next as well, so that in the future, we know that going to A would be much quicker if we just went through D instead. So yeah, once again, we chug along until we hit this combination. And of course, in this case, we want to go from C to A, and we're testing this alternate path to see if it's better. Clearly, it isn't, which is why we move on without updating anything. And yeah, essentially, we've gone through every node now, and that is the end of our trace. And what this means is, we haven't really done very much. Most of the connections are already optimal, and with the exception of going from B to A, well, we've found that path too. With all the information collected here, we can move from basically any node to any other connected node using the shortest path possible. For example, if I want to go from B to A, I will query this table, right, and I will know that, well, it only costs 3 to go from B to A. How do I do it? Well, I go from B to D, and I can go from D directly to A. So yeah, that is essentially the trace of this algorithm. Now, if you're like me, you've probably found that trace a little bit unsatisfying. So what I've done is I've cobbled this together, 
It is basically just an automated visualization. You know, the graph is drawn automatically. The trace is done with the algorithm itself. And yeah, because we have so many nodes now, it's going to take an extremely long time. I'm not going to create a presentation to show you the entire steps. So this works nicely. As you can see, the whole OV cube nature of this algorithm really shows here because you can see how much work the algorithm needs to do to give you your results. In fact, since we're talking about this, it is probably quite easy to transition to our time complexity discussion. Analyzing this algorithm is dead simple for the very simple reason that, well, we have three nested loops right here and they run from zero to V. In other words, this is an OV cube algorithm. Now that we understand what the algorithm does, let's take a look at one of its little pitfalls, which it actually shares with Bellman Ford's algorithm. And that is the fact that if you have a negative cycle, well, your result is going to be wrong. Floyd Warshall's algorithm gives us a very simple way to detect these negative cycles. Remember how at the beginning of this algorithm, we have a distance array and we've basically set all the diagonal values to zero. What this means of course is that to get from one node to itself, you incur zero cost, which makes sense because you're really not moving anywhere. But here's the deal. If a negative cycle exists, what's going to happen is it is actually cheaper to go through a negative cycle back to yourself. What this means is at the end of the day, if you find that any value on a diagonal is actually negative, it means that there is a negative cycle somewhere because, well, that reflects the fact that we've actually taken a shorter path through a negative cycle. So yeah, that's how you check for negative cycles in the Floyd Warshall's algorithm. In fact, that is basically it. There isn't a whole lot to say about this particular algorithm because the way it works is so similar to its cousins. We are almost done with pathfinding and in fact we're almost done with this entire series but next time we're going to take a look at a very specific and very interesting way of doing pathfinding leading to one of the most interesting problems in computer science. That's all there is for this episode, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may want to check out a playlist of the other videos in this series. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.